Can you hear me well? Good. Um, so last week we heard the wonderful message delivered by Joshua and uh, we thought about our identity. Uh, Joshua 1 uh, verse 9 says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is such an important uh, Bible verse that we or need to uh, keep in our mind as we live um, our life on earth. Uh, especially, you know, one of the slides that Joshua showed us last week, I really like that slide, that, that image of a mirror, right? You know, he said the word of God is like the mirror that really shows us who we truly are. And there was this, I think it was a cat standing in front of a mirror and uh, the reflected image was not a cat but a lion right i think uh, that was it and yeah sometimes we really do not know who we are uh, and we really need to understand who we are based on the mirror of the word of god uh, so i there was uh there was so interesting to me and i uh, i hope and uh, pray that we all uh, may remember who we truly are. We are God's children and we are forgiven sinners and we are God's elect and we are the people in whom Christ died and lives. Today we will continue to think about our identity from a little different perspective. Uh, we are going back to Romans, actually the very last part of Romans except the final greetings. So you can call it as a conclusion or a concluding remark of this letter of Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome. Uh, so we'll think about this part. Um, the passage uh, that we have today is chapter 15, um, verses 14 to 33. And the key verses are 15 and 16, 15 and 16. Let me read the key verse for you. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And the title that I uh, um, came up with for this passage and message is Paul, a minister of Christ, by Christ, and for Christ. Paul, a minister of Christ, by Christ, and for Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, thank you so much for your uh, your amazing blessings uh, through um, the book of Romans thus far. It has been a long journey and we learned so many things, uh, especially about the gospel and the gospel centered life, spirit led life uh, and what the church should be like. Uh, we learned so many things. Uh, now, as we study this very last passage except the final greetings, uh, we ask for your mercy and grace one more time. Lord, please come and speak to us by your spirit. Uh, may you please uh, use me as your instrument to speak your word to your people and whatever that may be, we may hear your voice through this message. Please bless this message and bless all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's look at verses 14 to 16. I don't have any slides, so you will need to have your Bible with you and follow me. So please take a look at your Bible. Romans chapter 15, the first paragraph, which is verses 14 to 16. Let me read. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, 
that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Yet, I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we just read these a few verses, uh, the first part of this passage. What, what does Apostle Paul say here? What is he talking about as he concludes his letter, his long letter, right? So what is he saying? Paul is basically saying that, I'm sure you know the things I wrote in this letter, right? It seems that the Roman Christians were quite mature and they were, uh, they understood the gospel and everything, you know. He, Paul is saying, I, I know you know the things I wrote in this letter. What are, what are the things Apostle Paul wrote in this letter? What's the key point of chapters one to um, chapter one, verse one to chapter 15, verse 13, the previous part? What, what are the key points? Uh, I think the key points are the gospel truth and the gospel centered life, right? The gospel truth, like justification, sanctification, right? Um, and the gospel centered life. Paul says here, I know you heard of these things many times, and you live a pious life as well. You are even competent to teach these things to other people. But, but, I still want to remind you of them because God has called me as a minister of Christ Jesus to people like you. And it is my duty to proclaim the gospel repeatedly. He also added at the end of this part, the goal of my ministry is you being sanctified by the Holy Spirit and offer your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. I just paraphrased it, but that's basically what he's saying, right? So if that's what the Pastor Paul is saying here, what do we learn from this part? How does it apply to us? I thought about two things. Uh, first, we all need to be reminded of the gospel repeatedly. No one is an exception. We all need to be reminded of the gospel repeatedly, right? That's why we come to worship and that's why we have Bible study and we keep studying the gospel again and again, right? But at the same time, we feel the need to study it again and again. Martin Luther once said, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. That's so true. So think about this past week. Did you act out of self-righteousness or self-condemnation? Were you easily offended or frustrated or angered in your, in your interaction with your family and friends? Were you afraid of something seriously that you couldn't really do what you had to do? These are some of the symptoms we experience when we forget the gospel. Well, I have to admit that I forgot the gospel many times last week. Um, that's why we all need to hear the gospel every day. One way to do that is to read Romans or Galatians that explains the gospel truth very well, right? Memorizing Bible verses like, like Daniel does, right, is even better. Uh, I heard that our general director, Pastor Moses Yoon, has a great habit. Uh, he even called it hobby, <laughs> and that is memorizing Bible verses every day especially every night 
in his bed, you know, before he, you know, falls asleep, he memorized certain verses. And the next morning, as, as soon as he wake, uh, wake, wakes up, he tried to memorize what he memorized uh, the, the very last night. So that's how he memorizes about like 10 verses each day. And he says, uh, this kind of memorizing Bible verses uh, is very powerful in his life because when certain things happen, he automatically remembers certain Bible verses related to this circumstance and apply that to himself and others. I think that's a great habit. So the first thing that we thought about was that we all need to be reminded of the gospel. The second thing in this part um, is that we are ministers of Christ Jesus. We are ministers of Christ Jesus. Let me ask you, how many of you think that you are a minister? You are a minister. How many of you think that you are a minister? Raise your hand. I don't see many hands. Yeah, uh, most married people, I don't see Nate raising his hand. <laughs> so, you know, how many people, how many of you think you are a minister, right? Or, or I should say gospel worker. I don't see many young people raising their hand on the screen. Well, how about this? You know, if you remember what Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he said, we Christians are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. He called us as a priest, a royal priesthood. How about Apostle Paul? Apostle Paul said in his letter to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6 reads, Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter cures, but the spirit gives life. He called us ministers of a new covenant. So, yeah, you know, we can find this kind of Bible verses that, that you know, basically says that God calls us to be ministers of Christ Jesus and do gospel work. It is God's amazing grace that we are called to be ministers um, uh, of the gospel and participate in God's redemptive history. You probably remember what Apostle Paul said in chapter one. He said, uh, we received grace and apostleship, right? grace and apostleship. Here in this part, Apostle Paul is saying that even the apostleship or the ministership is a part of God's grace. Now, if we admit that we are the minister of Christ Jesus, then what is our priestly duty as a minister? What does Apostle Paul say here as his duty, priestly duty? The first thing that we find in verse six, uh, 16 is that we, uh, we must proclaim the gospel of God to the people, right? Proclaiming the gospel to other people. The second thing that I find in actually verse 18, 18 is that we lead them to obedience to God by what we say and do. So we lead them to the obedience to God by what we say and we do. I think Apostle Paul was a great example of this. He not only proclaimed and taught the gospel, right, but also he set a good example as a Christian, as a Christian who uh, um, was fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody saw how, how he was suffering for the gospel. 
right? How he sacrificed himself for the gospel. I think Jesus was even a better example. Right? Jesus not only told others by word, but he set a great example through his action and life. That's what we should follow. How about the purpose of our ministry? What is the purpose of our ministry? If you look at the last part of verse 16, 16b, you can find the purpose of our ministry in 16b. What is it? It's for internal sanctification. Internal sanctification. In other words, being transformed into the image of Christ by the renewing of our mind instead of conforming to the pattern of this word. Some ministers focus on visible outcomes, such as the number of people in the church or like, you know, building a new church building type of things. I also saw some ministers raising their own army, their own army who could be loyal to them. Of course, outwardly, they claim to raise the soldiers of Jesus Christ, but as a matter of fact, they put themselves in Jesus's place and control the people according to his, their own whim and will. This is a wrong motive and wrong goal of the ministry. We all must remember that we are ministers of Christ. Ministers of Christ. In other words, we belong to him. He is the one who elected us and who called us. He is the one who holds the authority over everything, including our ministry and life. Now let's move on to the next part. Uh, verses 17 to 19. 17 to 19. Um, Joseph, can you read these verses for us? Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except when Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. And 19? Um, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed to God the gospel of Christ. So, thank you, Joseph. Um, so, what does this part uh, mean? What is Apostle Paul saying here? Um, if you look at uh, the New American Standard Bible, uh, verse 17 reads, Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. In Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God. Apostle Paul worked very hard for the gospel ministry, and he has accomplished more than anyone else. He proclaimed the gospel all the way from Jerusalem in the east to Illyricum, which was located at the border between Greece and Rome, so in the west. Overcoming dangers and threats, Paul preached the word and raised disciples of Jesus wherever he went, and he founded new church. But he's not boasting of them as his own accomplishments. He makes it very clear here that everything he has done is actually the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit through him. This is a very important point. Everything he has done is actually the work of God done through him. So what can we learn here in this part? Again, I want to think about two things. Uh, first, our ministry is the work of the Holy Spirit. Our ministry is the work of the Holy Spirit. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Um, you probably know um, UBF online forum, right? When I attended the second UBF online forum, there was a breakout session and uh, I was grouped with 
several different people. And one of them was a shepherd from Africa. I forgot his name, um, but he was very mature servant of God from Africa. And this was one thing that uh, he mentioned as uh, what he learned through uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. He said, I have learned that apart from Jesus, I cannot do anything. That's one thing I learned. And that's so true, right? We cannot control anything nowadays. Tiny little coronavirus seems to have taken over the control of everything. Think about the schools. You know, every school is now online. Drexel just declared that we'll go online in four. They just just changed their policy. I mean, their uh, their plan. Initially, they were going to go for hybrid system. So I was quite excited, but they now changed a few days ago. The president of Drexel sent out an email saying that everything will be online, period. My daughter Grace's SAT exam, which was scheduled next week, was canceled. Uh, For your information, the royal family, so we don't have to come to your place (laughs) to take the exam (laughs) because the exam was canceled. We don't have any control. How about our gatherings and travels and work and businesses? Everything is under the control of coronavirus nowadays. We thought we could do anything. Uh, We thought we could do anything and everything, but we are in full control of everything. Uh, And we are in full control of everything, but the reality is that we are quite vulnerable. The current pandemic is a humbling experience for all of us. It helps us to turn to God and depend on him. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. All we have is actually nothing. But when we work with him, when we work with the Holy Spirit, we can experience his miraculous power in our life and ministry. Let me me share a story that I read a few days ago. there is a young pastor and he was talking about a story. So what he experienced during his seminary days. So as a seminary student, uh, he had to, um, you know, had have a side job to support himself. So he worked at UPS and he did the night shift. So he worked overnight and just, you know, just like, uh, you know, Michel Paulus, you know, worked kind of overnight and, Early in the morning, he was driving home, and you know, as you can imagine, you know, he studied uh, for his seminary during the day, and he worked overnight. So you, we can imagine how tired and exhausted he must have been. So he was falling asleep while driving. It was so dangerous. He did everything. He he turned on the radio and uh, sang a song, and he slapped on his cheek, you know, and he did everything, but he couldn't really uh, prevent himself from falling asleep. And again, he fell asleep. And the next thing he remembers that he was on his, uh, on his driveway. So he thought that's strange. He remember he fell asleep. And the next thing he remembers is he, his car was on the driveway. So he entered the house. And surprisingly, his wife was awake on the bed. And the first thing she asked was, honey, how was your drive? And the pastor, you know, and back then the seminary student said, oh, that's funny you asked that question. And he explained what happened. Then his wife said, uh, she was sleeping and all of a sudden he, she woke up and she was compared to pray. And she immediately uh, realized that her husband was um, kind of in a danger. So she you know, when prompted by the Holy Spirit, even while sleeping, right? The Holy Spirit prompted her to wake up and to pray for her husband. And she prayed honestly. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he came home safely. That that was an amazing story. Um, And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we become proud or frustrated as we see the outcome of our work. But let us remember that our ministry is the work of the Holy Spirit. If you remember this, we don't have to be proud. We don't have to be even frustrated as we see the 
outcome. We can just humbly co-work with the Holy Spirit in any circumstance. So the first thing I mentioned is that our ministry is the work of the Holy Spirit. The second thing I want to think about in this part is that if we boast, we must boast in Christ Jesus. It is difficult to not boast of our accomplishment and experience, no matter how little they may be. You know? We want to always boast about what we have done, what we have experienced, you know, what we have accomplished, you know, things like that. Boasting is closely linked to our desire to be recognized by other people. There is a variation among people, but we all have a desire to boast and be recognized. Ministers can fall into this trap as well. They serve people and do many good things voluntarily, but soon they find themselves wanting to be recognized by other people. If others fail to recognize your good work, what happens? We feel bad and offended. I find myself falling into this trap all the time. How about you? What do you boast? When do you want to be recognized by other people? How do you feel when they don't recognize you for your good work? You know, this is not the first time Apostle Paul mentioned about boasting in this letter. Uh, let's go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, let's all go to chapter 3 of Romans. This is an important part, so I want to read together with you. Let's read 21 to 27. Chapter 3, 21 to 27. And also, you know, uh, another reason why I want to read together with you uh, is uh, this is a good reminder of the gospel to all of us, okay? So chapter three, verses one, uh, 21 to 27, let me read. But apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires work? No, because of the law that requires faith. Another part is chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 5. Chapter 5, 3 to 5. Chapter 5, 3 to 5. Let me read. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Here, glory can be translated as uh, rejoice uh, or boast. Okay. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen. You know, Paul was not always like this. You know what, the, what, what Paul's original name was? Saul, right? Saul. Name, he was named after the great King Saul in Israel's history. So maybe... You know, he also wanted to be like great king. You know, he wanted to be a great person, great man, great leader. But if you look at uh, the book of Acts carefully, starting from chapter 13, he is referred to as Paul. Okay. Jesus didn't change his name. There is a many uh, misunderstanding about it, but Jesus didn't change his name. But uh, starting from Acts chapter 13, he is referred to as Paul. 
So we don't know who changed it. Maybe the author of the book of Acts, Luke, changed his name, or Paul himself changed his name. But what's more important is not the, the name change, but character change, right? If Saul means a great king or great man, poor means humble and small. Humble and small. I was also uh, reminded of John the Baptist as I was meditating on this part. John the Baptist, when uh, you know, he heard from his own disciples that Jesus was drawing more attention from the crowd, John the Baptist said, he must become greater and I must become less. He must become greater and I must become less. It is my prayer that um, we may learn from Apostle Paul and John the Baptist. And if we have to boast, we may boast in Christ Jesus. Let us glory in Christ Jesus in our service to God, in our ministry to God. Let's move on to the next part, verses 20 to 22, 20, 21, 22. 20, 21, 22. Let me read. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Here we see Apostle Paul's ambition and passion. His ambition was to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Paul's ambition was different from worldly ambition or selfish ambition, like to make our name known, right? or to accumulate things, or to build up his own reputation. Paul's ambition was an amb ambition for God. His passion was the passion to preach the gospel. We can call it a holy ambition. His zeal was for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know, if you come to Drexel campus, you probably have seen the sign that says, Ambition can't wait, right? Ambition can't wait. Um, I think they started this campaign like 2017 or 18. Basically what they mean is, you know, um, we want to attract hardworking, motivated and ambitious young people, young men and women to come to Drexel. And we want to emphasize that Drexel, Drexel's curriculum and our cooperative education program can offer great opportunity to these ambitious people. So come to Drexel. That's basically the meaning of the campaign. Ambition can't wait. So they should come and let their ambition come true. Apostle, Paul, Apostle Paul's holy ambition couldn't wait. He wanted to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. He went to one town and converted a few people there. And he focused on raising disciples, which, led, which eventually led to founding a new church. Then he moved to another town and served the pioneering ministry there again. He started from the scratch all over again. And he did it over and over again in many different towns. Whenever he moved to a new place, he had to contextualize the gospel so the locals with different cultures and background could understand and accept the gospel. William Carey, you, do, you, do you know William Carey? William Carey was one of the first uh, missionaries sent by the Reformed Christian Church uh, in 18th century. He said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. He was actually a shoe shining boy. I think I mentioned his story many times in my message before. He was a shoe shining boy, but when he received God's word and vision, he had an ambition for God. And he wanted to go to 
uh, foreign country, especially India, as a missionary. So he studied Indian, Indian languages as he was working as a shoe shining boy. And when the time came, he got the sponsors and he was sent out as a missionary. And he made a new history of Christian missionary movement. So do you have an ambition for God? Do you have a passion to preach the gospel? In this COVID-19 era, many people are clueless. You know, we, we do not know what to do with campus mission. But surprisingly, to some people, this is actually a great opportunity. You know, we, you know some of us participated in this webinar yesterday, and uh, there was a missionary, uh, Charles Kim, from Ryerson UBF, and he shared a very interesting story, right? He had a broken anchor, and so he had to stay home for a while, and, uh, you know, he was helpless, but he uh, thought to himself that, oh, you know, let's, you know, let's not just waste time. Let me just try to do something online, and that's how he started his Facebook ministry, and he made friends with many college students, he has like 3,500 Facebook friends, like 10 times more than, than, than you know, what I have. So this way he reached out to college students and actively invited them. And his worship service attendant tripled uh, from like nine to like 27 or something. And his ministry is prosperous nowadays. I also heard an interesting story about Dr. Samuel Yu in Ethiopia. Um, he is working at a hospital and uh, he uh, started group Bible study with, with the hospital staff and some Muslim uh, brothers and sisters joined and they were converted into Christianity. What a great work of God. God, uh, God is also giving me a holy ambition or passion nowadays as I as I am engaged in the headquarter ministries, um, God gave me a lot of new ideas and I was able to participate in this like, prayer relay uh, movement and donation movement and online forum and vision camp nowadays. Uh, it keeps me busy, but uh, I'm full of vision and, um, and uh, sense of mission. I heard an interesting story from Dr. Joseph Cho, who is leading UBF online mission support group the other day. Um, before, when he heard about, when he heard this prayer topic, one of the UBF prayer topics, uh, which is to send out 100,000 missionaries to uh, uh, 233 countries by year 2041, he did not believe it in his heart. He just thought to himself that, oh, this, this is not realistic. Right? He pray, prayed for it, but he thought to himself, this is not realistic. How many of you actually believe it as you pray for that prayer topic, right? What Dr. Joseph Cho said was, as he was like uh, looking into online ministry nowadays, like YouTube ministry, you know, uh, and how many followers some people have, you know, things like that, he now believed that 100,000 missionaries sending out, raising and sending out 100,000 missionaries to 233 countries is not a joke. It's not unrealistic. It's quite realistic online. So he shared that story of renewed vision and I was inspired by the story as well. It's not unthinkable prayer topic anymore. So how can you have this kind of holy ambition like William Carey? like um, uh, Apostle Paul, like, Dr. Char uh, like Missionary Charles Kim and Dr. Samuel Yu. Holy ambition comes from receiving God's heart for the fallen world. And this heart, God's heart, comes when we hear God's word. When we hear God's word, God creates a fire in us. And we get to preach the gospel and we experience God's power. And this is an energizing cycle. May God reignite a holy ambition and holy passion in our heart as we begin a new academic year. Amen.
Look at the next part, 23 to 29, 23 to 29. Uh, Moses, can you read this part for us, 23 to 29? Okay. Um, <clears throat> but now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia, we're pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know, what when, I know that when I come to you, I'll come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Thank you. So Apostle Paul's work in Corinth and in the region was almost complete. So um, the only remaining uh, mission he had was to deliver a special relief offering collected from Macedonia and, and Achaia to Jerusalem church. Probably the, the Christians in Jerusalem church were suffering from poverty uh, severely uh, at that time. And I don't think, you know, the church in Macedonia and Achaia was, uh, were rich, but still, you know, uh, out of their uh, compassion and their willing, uh, cheerful heart, they wanted to help uh, other brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. So they made a donation, special donation, and Paul's job was to deliver it to Jerusalem church. You know, that reminded me of our UBF uh, donation movement that we, we are having nowadays. Uh, many missionaries and, you know, co-workers are suffering um, financially nowadays. They lost their jobs and they uh, closed their business. Some people were worrying about their uh, rent for the next month, like $400 or something. And when we heard about this, we started this donation movement. And in several months, we collected over $250,000 and headquarters has been able to su support these missionaries and co-workers in financial difficulties. And they are so thankful to all of us. Uh, Apostle Paul explains his future plan here, which is to go to Spain, right? Because Spain was known as the western end of the earth back then. So he really wanted to go to Spain. And also he wanted to visit Rome on the way there, right? So did his plan work? If you look at uh, Acts chapter 21 to 28, you will, um, you will learn what happened to him. He was able to go to Jerusalem and deliver this, you know, special offering. And he was welcomed by the church. But what happened next was quite um, surprising. He was arrested by, uh, in the city by the false accusations raised by some Jewish people. Uh, he was almost killed, but a Roman commander intervened and arrested him. And when they found out that Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen, uh, they protected him and sent him to Rome for a trial, right? And there were many episodes, for example, like on the way to Rome, he, is, he experienced a shipwreck and he had to stay in, the, in an island for a while, you know, things like that. Um, but to make a long story short, so he arrived in Rome and he was put in a um, put in a house arrest, like quarantine, right, for two years. Uh, and tradition says that Paul was released after that and went, to, went on his fourth mission journey, including Spain, and he probably visited Rome. We don't know for sure because the Bible, the, the book of Acts and um, the description about his stay in Rome, but you know, tradition says that he was able to visit those places as he had planned. Now let's look at the final verses, 30 to 33. 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there, so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. So what is this? This is Apostle Paul's prayer request. He is asking the Roman Christians to pray for him. He is asking them to pray for his safety because there are many dangers, especially there are many enemies among the Jews, right? So he is praying for his safety in his journey and also the uh, successful, uh, successfully completing his mission, which is to deliver this uh, special offering to Jerusalem church and they may receive it favorably. Here we uh, find the importance of intercessory prayer. Even Apostle Paul needed other Christians to pray for him. A few weeks ago, I was able to uh, study Moravian Christians, uh, their revivers, spiritual revivers, and one of the things that really struck me was their 24-hour prayers. Um, so God started this um, spiritual revival among them through repentance. And 24 men and 24 women volunteered to pray one hour every day. And they cast lots and they assigned each hour to each person. So 24 men here and 24 women here, you know, taking care of 24 hours each day. And later, many other people joined them in this prayer movement, including children. And this way, they prayed 24-7 for over 100 years. And that's how they supported their missionaries abroad. That story was very powerful. So I share this story with the people who are joining in, the, in our prayer movement nowadays. We just started this 24-hour prayer relay project. And I'm so thankful to many of you who are participating in this. The key verse for the prayer relay project is Ephesians 6.18, and it goes like this. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So let us be diligent in our intercessory prayers. So today's passage is the conclusion of this letter. Which part spoke to your heart? At first, I thought, well, there was not much to think about in this passage. But as I meditated on it, I could learn so many things as I shared today. What touches me most is Apostle Paul's identity and attitude as a minister of Christ. I had an inspiration from Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and titled the message, Poor, a Minister of Christ, by Christ, and for Christ. I think all three parts are very important. Of Christ, by Christ, and for Christ. Of Christ means that we are God's elect. We have God's calling. By Christ means that our ministry is not our show, but actually the work of the Holy Spirit. For Christ means that all we do are for the sake of Christ Jesus. The core is for the sake of Christ Jesus. And all three uh, are important. If you, if you neglect one of these, um, then you may become a weird minister. Right? So think about that. If you are all a minister of Christ and for Christ, but if you are not, if you, if you don't follow that by Christ principle, then you may rely on your hard working, your own ability, rather than relying on the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So these three components are all very important. May God help us to have a clear identity as a minister of Christ Jesus, 
and we may have the attitude that Apostle Paul had and serve our new academic year ministry wholeheartedly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, blessing our uh, Roman study and giving us this concluding remark. And especially, uh, we are deeply uh, impressed by Apostle Paul's uh, clear identity and attitude as a minister of Christ Jesus. Father, thank you so much for reminding us of the gospel. We, we really do need the gospel to be reminded every day because we forget it every day. Father, please help us to continue to come back to the gospel and be reminded of the gospel and apply the gospel to our life and be able to teach the gospel to others as a minister of Christ Jesus. Help us to be your minister of Christ by Christ and for Christ. May you bless our new academic year ministry and bless um, uh, our Bible study and reaching out to campus students through online uh, social media and bless all our activity and our uh, fellowship and community. Thank you so much for this time. We pray in Jesus' name.